But unfortunately for them, they showed me where that code was and I was able to see that using Burp Sweep to intercept that information, look through that information and find where the weaknesses was and then exploit it using uh, you know, just some simple tools of sending and receiving. Now, I want you to understand what Burp is kind of designed to do, what it can do and what it doesn't really do. everyone, David Bombal back with Daniel from IT Pro TV. Really had a lot of great feedback about the series. Please continue to give us your ideas of tools that you'd like to see Daniel demonstrate. Big shout out to IT Pro TV for sponsoring the series. Daniel, what are you showing us today? Today, I figured we'd go ahead and uh, get neck deep into the lovely little tool known as Burp Suite, right? Now, uh, this is uh, something that a lot of people are very interested in and for good reason, because it is a great tool, it's a very well-known tool. Uh, a little bit of a, a, a FYI, right? Uh, for your information, there are two versions of Burp Suite. One is the community edition, which is free for anyone that would wish to play around and have a good time with this. And you can do a lot with that, but there's also a paid version. I think it's running between like four or 450 a year for a license for the paid version. There is some advantages to having that pay for version which we'll discuss as we see kind of some of the limitations behind the free version, which is what I'm going to use today. Um, but like I said, you can still get a lot of stuff done and still really understand a lot of web application testing uh, with using Burp Suite just with the community edition. So don't feel like you're being shorted or slighted or anything if you don't have that pay for version. Uh, but if you end up becoming like a, a professional tester, that would be a good tool to have in your toolkit. So I would recommend paying for it. So Daniel, I've had this question from a lot of people. Uh, Kelly or Carly has a whole bunch of tools. It does. Uh, how does Burp Suite fit into this? So Burp Suite is kind of the gold standard when it comes to web application testing. That's that's why it finds itself inside of Kali. I would assume it's also in Parrot and Black Arch and any other pen testing. Uh, shoot, I've got Linux boxes and even my Windows box as well. I have Burp Suite on all of those things, not because I necessarily want to do some sort of web app testing with it, but every now and then I'll see something weird or something's not working the way I think it should and I'm dealing with some web app and it's it's just acting weird. I'll throw it through Burp Suite so I can kind of inspect and see what's going on in there and maybe figure out, oh, that's what's going on. That's, that's my problem. So it's it's really good at helping you understand how web applications work and what's going on underneath the hood that you just don't see because it's not really meant for you to see. That's not the way most web apps are designed. So they're, they're, that's why you have front ends, right? You have a front end and that's what the user is supposed to experience. But there's all sorts of craziness happening underneath the hood <laughs> that you typically just don't, are not aware of because it's not for you. If you wanna see what that stuff is, Burp Suite is a great way to do that. And that's why you find it in pen testing uh, distributions like Kali and, and Parrot and all that. And also that being said as well, most organizations have some web application, whether it's yeah. just a straight static page of here's our company and it's, you know, an old angel fire kind of thing happening or GeoCities or something uh, <laughs> to full blown, modern, very contemporary styled uh, web applications that are very dynamic and do different things. So there's a lot happening. And in all that moving parts that are underneath that hood, there could be a flaw. And if you can't see it or manipulate it or interact with it, because you don't have any way to do that other than maybe the, um, the tools that come with your browser, if you have the wherewithal to work with that, maybe you could do it that way. Burp Suite's a great way to be able to look into those mechanisms that are happening underneath the, the hood that you don't normally see and even interact with it, start to change and poke and maneuver things and see what happens if I do this? What happens if I change this value? Will the application do something different or will it just error? We don't know. So that's why you see Burp Suite all the time. That's great. So, I mean, I I don't want to stop you. We want to get to the demo as soon as we can. But just before we get to that, you using a local installation, this is your own test lab, is that right? Correct. I have a couple of VMs. One of them is the Kali machine that we're looking at right now. And uh, the other will be um, the... Broken web application, the BWAP, 
It's old, but it's useful. It has a lot of great stuff, especially for demonstration purposes. We, we want to see how some of this stuff works. Now, another caveat, I just make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to the why we're doing this, right? What, uh, what, what I'm going to do with my demonstrations. I'm not trying to necessarily teach you how to hack certain things. We want to take a look at what Burp Suite can do and some of the functionality that it has. So that's why I choose certain things when it comes yep. to our demonstration purposes. BWAP is going to be great for this because it has a lot of different like OWASP uh, vulnerabilities that we can kind of look at and just play around with as far as well, how Burp Suite might help us with this. So that's why we're using BWAP for this demo. That's great. Go for it. I don't want to stop you. Okay, well, let's jump in here. I've already got the browser up and running, so it's running the BWAP. I have my uh, IP address and everything put into or the URL into the address bar. I'm just going to move that out of the way for right now. And since I'm in Kali, if I want to start Burp Suite, I just hit the little icon and start typing Burp, and it's usually the first one that comes back. So I, you might be thinking, well, I, I think I know how to start Burp Suite, right? But <laughs> I have everything connected to the internet. So Burp is going to act normally like it would if you're actually testing a live application that would be out on the internet. So you can see it's like complaining about uh, the Java runtime environment. Uh, appears to be 11. So you might see stuff like this if this is your first rodeo. I'm just kind of giving you that that real uh, look into how this thing works. So I'm just going to uh, rather assume no knowledge. It's better that right, way. Right. I don't. I don't want to assume anybody's uh, level of expectation. And it's telling me even though I just installed Kali and I ran all the updates that it still has an update rating. Maybe this just came out. Um, but I, I won't update. But you might see this, and if you want to, this would be a great time, an easy way for you to do an update. You could update now. And you can update it to the latest version. And it's telling that there is a persistible intruder attacks and small improvements. We'll get to that later. So, yes, I want to exit the wizard. Oh, no, no, no. I'll just hit close. <laughs> what am I doing? All right. This brings us to our project page. So if you wanted to have multiple different uh, testings going on, you can kind of save them as projects. It's very helpful for us to be able to go. I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel and go back and get all that information that I got before in the same way that I did it. I can just save it as a project. And there you go. Uh, right now, I'm just going to use a temporary project. I don't think I have project capabilities. Yeah. You'll note disk-based projects are only supported in Burp Suite Professional. That brings us to our very first uh, kind of a ding against the community standard or the community version. It doesn't allow you to save projects. You can only do temporary projects. But if I've got that pay for pro version, I would be able to save this and, and keep those projects if I was working on multiple projects. I would have that capability. All right, so I'm just going to hit next because that's all I can do. Then you have uh, configuration files. If you have some way to configure it, though we do have that option here. So if you have some uh, configuration files that you wanted to set things just right, maybe you're migrating from one machine to another and you wanted to load this up, that would bring all your, your sweet stuff that you love so much along with you, along the ride for you. But we're going straight out of the box, just like it was standard operating procedure. Bring it and it starts going. All right, so starting to build the project. It's going to launch the GUI here in just a moment. And when it does, you'll see there's a lot of stuff. And it is definitely can kind of feel overwhelming. We've got a bunch of tabs at the top here that have very cryptic naming conventions that probably don't mean a whole lot to anybody that's never worked with this before. So we're going to kind of work a little our way through that, kind of define some of the more common uh, tabs that you'll be working with if you are going to play around with Burp Suite and have it be useful for you. Here is just the dashboard, so it kind of gives you some information on what's going on here. But really, one best place to start is going to be at the target. So this is where you actually choose the information that you want to log, that you want to work with, because otherwise it's going to do everything. OK, any website that your browser that is hooked into Burp Suites looks for, reaches out to, it's going to start throwing it in here. And that can be a lot. If you have a bunch of tabs open, it's going to just start filling up with crazy data because you got to remember a lot of dynamic websites, they're constantly reaching out and phoning home and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Burp Suites is going to be indiscriminate out of, the, out of the box and say, I don't know that you don't want this. So I'm going to start grabbing it, right? The other place to start also is this proxy tab. And you'll notice by default, you have this little lovely thing right here that says the intercept is on. And you'll notice it just grabbed 
a request that my browser is making because my browser is already hooked into Burp Suite. It's waiting uh, to basically filter every request that it makes through that proxy. I just ha I have that set up. Now you can do that manually through your browser's proxy settings, or I use a plugin called Foxy Proxy, which makes it super easy. And I can kind of show you that really quickly in just a second. But yeah, that'd be great. I highly recommend turning that off like first thing. Just run over there and turn the interceptor off because otherwise it's just going to start. It's, you're not going to get very far. You're going to be like, why is anything working? So you definitely want to turn that off right out of the gate. All right. Once that's done, then you can kind of find where you want to land as far as your target goes, make some requests to the target, and then add the target to the scope. So let's go to Foxy Proxy first to show you how I did that. I believe Foxy Proxy has, uh, it's a plugin for both Firefox and Chrome-based browsers. So whatever browser you got, do a search for Foxy Proxy. It'll probably re return uh, with, hey, Foxy Proxy add-in for Chrome or Foxy Proxy add-in for Firefox. Click it, hit the install button. It should be good to go. Once you have that installed, let me uh, do this here. Let me get my zoom feature going here so we can kind of take a look at it. It's a little tiny, crazy thing. But it's right there. You can see it looks like a little fox. And mine says burp, right? And that's because if I click on it, I have all these different types of proxies that I've, I've created inside of Foxy Proxy. If I want, I can go to options and that'll take me to that page. And I got to get on here. There we go. And you can see it right here. You can, this is where you can add these things to... Uh, so if I want to add one, I could go add. You would put in, okay, I want it to be burp two or whatever it is, the type of proxy that you wish to use. And I'll just go HTTP. Then you give it the IP address. Since it's running locally, it'll be 127.0.0.1. Give it the port number. By default, burp uh, suite runs on port 8080, which is the default port, uh, proxy port for just about any proxy. So that's a, that's a well-known port. There you go. If you have any kind of username or authentication thing going on, you can add that stuff. And then you just hit save. And now I have burp2 up there, right? So once I want to use that, I go back up to my little corner office over here and I get you to zoom back in. I click it and I choose which one I want. So if I choose burp2, you'll see the check mark goes there. And now it will be using those proxy settings for my browser. And that makes it easy for me to turn it off when I don't want it. So if it's grabbing information I don't want it to grab or it's interfering with some sort of normal web requests I want to make, I can just turn it off really quickly. And then when I want to go back to Burp Suite, I choose the one I want and I hit okay and I'm good, All right? So that's, that's, that's proxy proxy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so yeah, definitely, definitely makes your life super easy because going into the browser settings and the preferences and finding the network area and the proxy, okay, put that in, type all that stuff, save those settings, and going back and forth between that is just a nightmare. Foxy Proxy makes that process just so much more seamless. So um, let's see here. Let's get back into this lovely little device. Now that we understand Foxy Proxy and what's going on there. Uh, now I have my web application. So what do I want to do? I want to start making requests. So I'm just going to kind of refresh this page so that it re-requests the page. Now, because I'm proxying, it should have grabbed that information. I should be able to go to Burp Suites. And under the proxy tab, you'll see an HTTP history, right? And I'll see all the requests that it has been made, that, it has, that my browser has been making. You can see the Firefox settings are in there uh, and anything else. So you can see how that can start to get very filled up. And I, I don't really want that. So it's going to send me back over to my target. And now inside of there, you can see I've got my target showing up. And I can choose what I want. So I can click on it, highlight it, right click, and say add to scope. Once I do that, I'll get this little, little like a warning here saying that I've added an item to the target scope. Do I want Burp Proxy to stop sending out of scope items to the history or other Burp tools? For our intents and purposes, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to stop getting traffic that I don't want. So I'm going to hit yes for this. Once I do that, I can zoom back out. And now I will only intercept under my proxy uh, history tab, only stuff from that in scope item. So now I'm only grabbing stuff from that IP address 
and everything else is going to get ignored in the history. So that's going to make my workflow a whole lot nicer, a whole lot easier. I'm only getting information that's actually pertinent to what I'm trying to do, okay? I'm going to have to ask you this, Daniel, because I always get asked these kind of questions. You chose HTTP and not HTTPS. Can we do both? Is there a restriction? No, you can absolutely do, do both. And that actually brings up a really good point. There is a certificate that you need to install into your browser to make sure that Burp Suite can work with HTTPS requests. So um, I guess that would be a good idea to show you how, how that thing works. So if I want to get that, I need to make sure that my browser is connected to Burp. It is, and what I need to do is go to HTTP and go to Burp Suite, like that. Now you'll get this weird page, but over in the right-hand top corner, you got this thing that says CA Certificate. You click on that, it should give you a download. Let me get to zoom back out here. If I can get that, let me grab that. You see that I'm, I'm downloading out, just save the file somewhere to where you know where it is. Once I have that, I believe it's called, and you can see it right there, cacert.dir is what it's called. I'm gonna cancel that because I already have it. Once I have that file, I need to install it into the uh, certificate area of my browser. So because I'm in uh, Firefox, I'm gonna hit the little hamburger icon over here on the top right-hand corner. I'm gonna go to preferences, and that's gonna take me to my preferences pages. Once I'm here for Firefox, it's gonna be under privacy and security. All the way down to the bottom of this page is a certificates area. I'm gonna hit view certificates, and then in here I have an import button, and I will hit import, and then I will tell it, hey, this is where I get that. I think mine's in downloads. So yeah, there's certca.dir. I would choose that and put that in there. Since I've already kind of done that, you would have one more um, thing to do. Let me, let me find that, that CA uh, really quickly, that certification. It's gonna be labeled Port Swigger because Port Swigger is, is the organization that creates Burt Suite and maintains Burt Suite. Let's see here, where are you at? It's in alphabetical order, so I should be able to find, but it's easy to pass them. There it is, Port Swigger. The one thing you're definitely gonna to wanna to do is when you see this screen right here that talks about the trust settings, you wanna make sure that you make it, that it trusts this certificate. Because if you don't, you'll get some weird errors and things won't work right. So make sure it can identify websites and, and make sure it can identify mail users. You'll get that when you're installing the cert. It'll ask you to verify those things. But if you forget, you can just jump back in here just like I did and edit the settings and make sure those are checked and then hit OK. I'm really glad you're showing all these, you know, so-called basic settings because it's often these kind of things that, you know, stumbling blocks when you, when you start out. Oh, man, I can tell you horror stories where I'm trying to like, <laughs> look, I'm like, why is this not grabbing this? I do not understand. I am going to set my computer on fire if it doesn't start doing it. Oh, that's... <laughs> That's my bad right there. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead with a with a, a error is here in the in the chair, and not in the computer. So uh, I've been down <laughs> that road once or twice, and it can definitely yep. frustrate you if you forget to do this type of step. So this is definitely some housekeeping stuff. If this is the first time you're dealing with Burp Suite, or maybe you've played with it before and it didn't work like you thought. Maybe it's because you didn't install the CA, and you're you're getting problems because of that. So that can definitely alleviate a lot of your issues. All right, so now that I've got all that stuff squared away, I've got it in there. Again, if it was Chrome, it would be a little different. You gotta find the preferences area for that. Find where you can um, import certificates in Chrome. I don't know where that is off the top of my head because I typically use Firefox. Yeah, don't worry. Um, but your mileage may vary. All right, we got that in there. We got it going on. We know how to get the CA, that's all good. Now let's go back to Burp Suite. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna start kind of messing around a little bit because I wanna remove all these, these things that, uh, actually what I can do is just right click. Right clicking is gonna be your best friend here in Burp because there's a lot of, of things that you do with the right click menu. So for what I'm gonna do is I just kind of right clicked anywhere in the HTTP history tab, and then I'm gonna just clear my history out. And that's gonna give us a clean slate to work with. And I'll hit yes, I wanna clear the history. And now I can go back to my web application refresh the page, and then switch back to Burp. And you can see I only have what I've done so far with something that's in scope. That's the target that is in scope, okay? So I can see now a little bit more. Now we're starting to get into the nitty gritty of Burp and what it does. 
Now, I want you to understand what burp is kind of designed to do, what it can do, and what it doesn't really do. And a lot of, let's start off with what it doesn't really do. In a lot of ways, I'm not saying perfectly, there might be some ways to do this, and we'll get to that in a little bit. It's not kind of a point and click hack stuff tool, right? And you might think, well, that's so disappointing. Come on. <laughs> That's so disappointing. What do you mean? I can't just install Burp Suite and start hacking websites? Not really. No, it doesn't. It's not what it's meant to do. So it's very informational. What it's, what it's meant to do is give you the ability to see what's happening and manipulate what's happening. You have to know what's going on to be able to really use Burp Suite effectively. So... If you're unfamiliar with web applications and kind of the basics behind that, HTTP methods, uh, PHP and JavaScript and all, HTML and CSS and all the normal stuff that happens with a web application, that's going to be an area you're going to want to increase your knowledge on. Now, Burp Suite will help you do that because you're kind of seeing that under the, under the hood uh, view into the application itself. And you're not just getting that normal user experience. So those concepts that you're learning about when you are learning that stuff is going to become more real and more tangible to you as you see them happen as Burp Suite interacts with that, All right? So it can be really helpful as a learning tool. And really, in my estimation, that's what it's meant to be, is kind of like an informational tool, I guess is a better way to put it, that it is giving you the information that you need and the ability to reach in and kind of manipulate that information to see if you're able to get the web application to do something maybe it wasn't designed to do, like bypass some sort of authentication or give you access into uh, some sort of secret functionality that you would never have known was there if you didn't actually get to see uh, because Burp Suite is allowing you to see that. So that's that's really what's going on here, right? Did, did you have any recommendations for courses to take to you know help? It? Let's say someone tries this and they're totally lost. Is there any training that you've created or something that you can recommend? I haven't done like a Burp Suite course per, per se. I, I have full intentions to do that, but I am but one man and time <laughs> is limited. What, what, what I mean, sorry, is like you, you mentioned like you need to know like uh, web applications. Is there anything that you'd recommend for that? Yeah, um, there's definitely um, good websites out there for learning how to do HTML coding and building web applications. So like things like W3 schools, I think is uh, probably a pretty popular um, yeah. um, stuff like that. I don't know if we have any here at IT Pro TV. Um, I would well, I would like to say we do, but I'm not 100% on that. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, no, that's fine. So you, it's general like, I mean, you've mentioned them already, so I won't rehash it. So that's great. Yeah. Um, Port Swigger does have the, uh, the Port Swigger Academy, which is a soup to nuts training in not only Burp Suite, but doing web application testing as well. That's so, great. And it's free. Um, it's, it's, it's really good training, actually. I, I, I like it a lot. That's great. I'll put a link below. All right. So that brings us back to Burp Suite, right? Uh, the thing we're here to look at. So the cool thing is you kind of manipulate some of this stuff. Like if you're not seeing things very well, I can kind of like collapse the inspector. And you'll notice that I'm getting this request and response. So over here is response. Over here is request. So these on the left-hand side are the requests that my browser was making. So when I click on something or I go to a page, that's the request to the web server to deliver that page back to me. And what I see in the response page was the response of the web server with the information. So there's going to be a lot of great information in both of these things. So you want to get comfortable with understanding what you should be seeing and um, how that information looks on both sides of the fence. So here I have my request. I have, um, let's see here, what do we got? We've got the get HTTP method asking for the BWAP forward slash login.php file, right? And then we see that was requested from host 10.11.14.189. Cool. I also have a user agent field. So these are all the HTTP headers that went along in my request. So it's telling it, it's telling the web server what page I want what my user agent was. So a user agent is a fancy term for what's the browser that I used. And then it kind of gives that information there. Um, what type of acceptable input it allows. So it accepts text and HTML, application, XHTML, XML, 
and so on and so forth, right? Uh, acceptable language, obviously this is in English. Uh, what else do we have here? We've got the different types of encoding. So it's in, it's accepting gzip and deflates. The refer, where did this request come from? It's showing that it came from the app itself. And then of course, uh, connection is closed because it's, it was just a, a simple static page basically. Grab that stuff, bring it back, and we're done. Uh, any cookie information that might go along with that? We do get a PHP session ID cookie right here. If you'll remember back when we did um, the SQL injection uh, with SQL map, we needed that PHP session ID information to hack the BWAP using SQL map to dump all that information. Yep. I could easily use Burp Suite to glean that information. We, we went through some crazy way through the browser <laughs> inspector tools to yeah. get that stuff. That seemed like a whole lot easier. And it, because it is, right? It's, I mean, that's relative, but in my estimation, that was a way easier thing to do, right? So this is that request that I made. Then of course, if we jump over, we see the response and we're seeing that I got a 200, which was that, hey, okay, I know that page. I'm sending it back to you. You don't have any kind of errors you didn't hit up against any kind of authentication or authorization walls that would stop you from going to that requested page that you would like. So I'm just going to go ahead and deliver it. A 200 is a nice thing. You might also get things like uh, redirections. So yeah, I know you went here, but we actually are going to send you over here because that's how the application is going to work. Knowing that could be a good piece of information for you as a tester looking for flaws in the application. So understanding that stuff. And of course, when that happened, what server was being used? Oh, look, there you go, right there. I, I can see that I, this server is running Apache 2.2.8. That's, uh, that's good recon right there. I can grab that information, put that in a file, and then maybe that's gonna be a part of my exploitation ventures, right? Maybe Apache 2.2.8 has a remote execution problem and I can remote code execute through some sort of Avenue in Apache 2.2.8. If I didn't know that, you'll notice that the web page doesn't tell me that stuff. I learned that looking at the request response headers, getting that information back, right? So maybe that would be something that the administer, uh, administrator of this web application would want to shut off. Stop sending that information back. They don't need to know that, right? I also see that it's running Ubuntu and We've got this mod fast CGI thing, letting me know that they're probably running CGI scripts, right? Again, knowing a bit about web applications and how they work is helpful for me because once I know that, then I can start to see, oh, well, if they run web application or um, um, CGI scripts, maybe there's a flaw in that. Maybe I can use a tool that, that exploits CGI scripting capabilities and I know that's where I need to go. Like I said, Burp Suite is really great about giving me the information I need and then I have to have the skills to kind of like follow up on that. So it's all about enumeration, or at least for the vast majority of what you're going to do. Not just you can't do some hacky stuff, and we'll play around with that just here in a second. But information is key. I also see that it's running PHP 5.2.4. Again, a lot of great information here. Powered by PHP 524-2. Maybe there's an exploit available for that. But I do know it's running PHP, so any of my exploits that will use PHP might be useful here. What else do we have here? Uh, and then of course, basically the document body is really where we want to go next is this is the source code. If you browse to a web page, let's, let's do that. Let's see here. Let's go back to the web page. What I'm seeing in that response in the body is basically if I just right click and said view page source and looking at this, this is the exact same stuff that we're seeing in Burp Suite. So you can see, bam, and there it is right over there. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong buttons. See, same stuff. That's so right. That's what's being returned. Now, obviously I could right click and do that as well and see that same information. But what I'm not seeing is are those, those headers, those response headers. So it's just easier to kind of look back and forth between the response and the requests right here in Burp Suite. So it's giving you a good, nice workflow. And you can kind of change this stuff uh, stylistically if you want to do top bottom or just the response and then have a tab for requests. So it just depends on what you want to do. Um, as the tester. All right. So now that we got kind of an idea of how this is working, let's kind of see it do things, right? Let's, um, let's jump back over here. I'm going to go here and let's, let's log in. 
So I'm gonna just increase the font a little bit, make it a little bigger. I'm gonna log in, it gives me some creds right here to log in with, so that makes that easy, B, and tab down to bug. And I'll log in. I don't care to save that, so I'll hit never save. And now I'm logged in, I can see, I think uh, if I zoom out just a bit, yeah. You can see it says welcome B right there. That was my username that it gave me to log in with. And I can now start interacting with the web application itself. Now, back to Burp Suite, right? We can see I've got a couple of new things. Like right here, I'm seeing that I've got a post request. Now I'm posting data. I'm actually sending data to be computed or worked with, processed, analyzed by the application itself using an HTTP post method. And I get to see that stuff right down here. Look at that. There's the stuff I put in. Now, this is really interesting information because I understand the idea of login, right? B was my password. And then it has password equals bug and security level equals zero and form equals submits. That's interesting. I didn't see that stuff when I typed in my username and password. It just said username, password, submit button. I did not see these things. Like I did have a security level button. I could have changed that from um, if we're looking back at it, I think it was like low, high, medium kind of thing. Where's that yeah. at? Oh, we'd have to log out. Let's log back out. Yeah, okay, we can do that. Yeah, so I've got this drop down option, low, high, medium, but that's not what we see in Burp Suite, right? We see this right here. It says security level zero. So zero is equaling low. Can I change that? Can I modify that? If I do, what happens? So this is where you start understanding how you use Burp Suites in real life land to start manipulating data. So maybe I want to catch that before I send it along the way, or maybe it's actually okay for me to actually replay this and work with it and see what it does. And that's where we're going to get into the different tabs that are available to us here at the top of Burp Suite. Because I can take this request that I've already sent, it's already been processed, it's already been dealt with. If I want to redo that, well, I could go back to the, the application, log out, change my settings, log back in, and see how that looks. Or I can right click and go send to repeater. You can also do control R if you like keyboard shortcuts. Once I do that, the repeater tab highlights, I can click on that, and there is the request. Now we can start actually playing around with this. I'm going to change our look so we get that side by side. So now I'm getting this request and response. And all I did was I went over here and you get this different layouts. So vertical layout, combined layout, and this is the, uh, what do they call it? Horizontal layout. So just keep that in mind if you want to do that. All right, so that's gonna give me, when I send a request, it's gonna allow it to show me the response immediately in the other pane. Just makes, that's the way I like to work. So if I, if I send this, let's see what happens. I get the response. I get a 302 not found here. And that's probably because I've already logged in and this is like a, a weird form. So it might not be able to work with that or maybe that cookie is expired, that session uh, cookie. You'll notice that that has, like you've got this five FC and then over here, the session cookie. That's the set cookie, not the session cookie. But there you go. And maybe there's some, some weird things happening there, but I got this 302. It's saying, hey, I didn't find that. Okay, that's fine. We're going to play with this a little bit more, but I just wanted you to see I can repeat a request that I've already done and kind of work with it, modify it. I could actually go over here and change this information. So if I wanted to change my uh, user agent, okay, take that out and we'll call it uh, Daniel's web br or browser like that. I can make that change. And then I can send that along and it will, it will take that in. That becomes important because sometimes an attack avenue will be done through the user agent string itself, All right? You do things like uh, local file inclusion, remote file inclusion. It could be that you're using the user agent string to actually manipulate that data and work with it. So it's important to know how do we, how do we change what's being sent along using Burp Suite? How can we manipulate that and, and manage it? to do what we want it to do instead of what is supposed to happen. And sending things to repeater is the most common way in which we do that. So uh, be really familiar with uh, repeater because it's gonna be super helpful for you 
as you start manipulating data and seeing uh, what kind of, now that I made a change, what's the response? Is it doing what I think it should be doing? Uh, it didn't work. Let me try changing something else. And you can have a bunch of them tabbed across the top. It doesn't have to be just one. You can have, I like to keep like a, a clean copy and then I can right click this right here and send that to repeater. And look, I've got another tab, right? I can go back to this one. I can work with it. I can start making different changes and going, oh, I like the way this responded. I, I want to kind of go down that road. Let me right click, send it to another repeater tab and kind of work with this. So this is just basically figuring out your workflow on how you're going to manipulate data and what's, what's right for you as far as uh, the capabilities of Burp Suite. All right, so now that we got kind of uh, the nuts and bolts behind what repeater does, we can actually kind of work with it. We can, we can use it. So let's see something useful, right? So let's go, let's log back into the uh, application here, B and bug and get in here. And I'm gonna choose one of my favorites just because it's fun. Let's see here. And it is going to be the, there it is, order tickets. This is called insecure direct object reference. Or in, yeah, insecure direct object. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what IDOR stands for. Click hack and we, we got ourselves a, a neat little application here where you can purchase tickets, right? You've got, I'll, I'll increase this here. It's got a, a very simple interface of how many movie tickets would you like to order? So cool, we're gonna buy some movie tickets and they're 15 euros per ticket. If I wanna order one ticket, I can hit confirm and we scroll down and we see that we ordered one movie ticket and the total amount charged for my account was 15 euros. I'm off to the races. Really cool, right? Everybody's happy. Everybody's having a good time. Now, what happens if we go to Burp and we look at what's happening there? So we'll jump back into our proxy tab, look into here, and I'm seeing, let's see here. We did a get for this, we did a post for that, and now I'm seeing that information. I'm seeing ticket quantity equals one, ticket price equals 15, and action equals order. Awesome. Let's send that over to the repeater. Let's see here, uh, let me get zoomed down here because it's getting crazy on me. All right, so once we go to the repeater tab, we should see, there it is right there. Get zoomed back in so you can see that that happens. Now let's, let's send that along. Let's hit the send button and take a look at the response. We got a 200, okay, just like what we expect to see. And let's see here if it tells us the same kind of information. This is all about the create user. So we're looking for the tickets. We did see that. Did it confirm? And it tells us you ordered one movie ticket. Total amount charged from is 15 euros. Cool. <laughs> Everything's fine so far, right? <laughs> Everything's working as we planned, except with an insecure direct object reference. I should not be able to change the ticket price or even have access to the ticket price. So I could do, I want 10 movie tickets and I want them for one euro. Is that okay? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> I'll hit send. We'll jump back over the response. It gave me a 200. Let's see what actually happens down in the code once it comes back with its response. And it says, you ordered 10 movie tickets and it charged me 10 euros. Right, so apparently one it, it, it's taking in as ten. But that's fine. It was still a whole lot cheaper than it was for one <laughs> ticket just a second ago. So you start to see like Burp Suite didn't do that, right? Burp Suite wasn't like, oh, I clicked something and I hacked it. Burp Suite gave me the information, allowed me to see what I needed to see to be able to go, oh, well, you 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 whoever coded this thing made a really bad mistake because you're now giving the user some way if they know what they're doing, which we do, and they shouldn't have that to, to manipulate that data, specifically that ticket price and ticket amount. They shouldn't be able to do that. All they should be able to do is set how many tickets they want and submit that. Other than that, it shouldn't give you any kind of other capabilities. But unfortunately for them, they showed me where that code was and I was able to see that using Burp Sweep to intercept that information, look through that information and find where the weaknesses was and then exploit it using, uh, you know, just some simple tools of sending and receiving. Now I've got myself 10 movie tickets for a dollar each. So I guess that's what it did. It did the math. It didn't, I was thinking it was going to give me 10 tickets for one euro, but it gave me 10 tickets at one euro each, hence the 10 euros. So it, it did the math for me. That's what it's showing. So, but still, like I said, 
whole lot cheaper. And of course, I could put it at zero, and then it would have been a zero euro. So play with this as you will. That would be something I would want to submit if they had something like a bug bounty program. I would say, hey, I found yeah. an IDOR in your system. Here's how I manipulated it. Here's how I exploited it. And here was the end result of it. You might want to change that and then hopefully get a payout on that. Uh, but there you go. The repeater can be super, super helpful for doing tasks such as this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing how simple it is. I mean, this is obviously a demo, but it's um, y you've made it look so simple. Well, I mean, it's it's simple if you know what you're looking for. Obviously, I have some knowledge about how a lot yeah. of these things work and these tactics and things of that nature. And this is meant to be very simplistic to kind of assure you that what you think you know is what you know, and you should be able to work with these. So, uh, so I really like BWAP for that. It's it it does lend itself to not necessarily holding your hand, but still not being so overly complex because real web applications are typically not that simplistic. So yeah. uh, you're going to get a lot of information. You're going to have to sift through a lot of data and deal with it and manipulate it and see if things work and do some testing, poking and prodding. So uh, yeah, we, we're having a good time here. BWAP is great for making sure I do know what it is I think I know and can I actually work with that if I saw it at least in a very simple fashion. And then you just got to take that and kind of, okay, it's going to be a job sifting through all these different web pages, looking for information. But I know that if I have any kind of input into the system, that's going to be good for me. I'm going to start looking to see, okay, I was able to submit input into the web app. Let me look at, see what that looks like underneath the hood using Burp Suite and see if there's any flaws in that. Maybe find a logic flaw, maybe find something as simple as this, where you're just giving me access into the system that you shouldn't be giving me, and then I can manipulate it and make my payday, as I, as you see. Daniel, that's fantastic. I mean, that's a it's a great little example of, of what Burp Suite can do. Is there anything else you can show us? Yeah, there's a bunch of different tabs, uh, some of them that you're going to use really commonly. One is like the intruder. Let's jump over to the intruder tab here. This is an interesting tab because this does kind of push the envelope as far as Burp Suite goes into that, I can actually use Burp Suite to kind of attack things because it is an attack mechanism that is built into the Burp Suite uh, uh, program. So I've got target that I wanna select, positions that I'm gonna work with, payloads, and different options. So let's see what that can kind of like look like in real life. Let's go back to our web app. Let us choose an application and I'm gonna use a, all right, let's see here, I wanna get a, like a, yeah, there we go, login form. That's what I'm looking for. There it is, let's hack that thing. All right, so this is the standard SQL injection against a authorization page. So if we look down, we see we've got enter your credentials. I can log in using like B and bug because we already have that and log in. And it should say, okay, there it is. Welcome B, how are you today? And then it kind of gives us whatever this secret thing is, any bugs. But does it fall prey to SQL injection? Well, I could try to manually test this, right? I can start popping in the single quote or one equals one and trying different things. But depending on the application, that might take time. Maybe they're doing some sort of filtering or maybe they got parameterization going on. Anything that might be stopping me from doing this or the application itself uses a weird version of SQL or the way it's working with so a lot of times uh, what you want to do with things like this is just fuzz that out. Do it programmatically. Let a computer do the heavy lifting for you because that's why we have computers. At least we should, <laughs> right? Uh, I know I don't like manually testing things for very long. If it doesn't get, if it's like three or four, t you know, tries and it's not working, I'm like, I give up. You know, I just give up immediately. Then I'm like, oh, yep. let me let the computer do this. Let's just jump it into Burp. So let's go to Burp. We should see that in our proxy setting under uh, the HTTP history. And I do see it. There it is right there. We've got that information, B, bug, form submit. And this was the SQLi underscore 16.php page. Awesome. We see the response. There it is. Everybody's happy, right? Let's um, now right-click, send to intruder. Once we get to the intruder, we now have a new target area, right? So super fun, a lot of good times. It's basically what web page do you want to attack and what port is that on? 
There you go. It's got the IP address and the port. But over here in positions, this is where it starts to get fun. So you'll notice it's got like, hello? Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. <laughs> it's got these uh, like highlighted areas with this weird syntax like things around them. It's basically trying to figure out maybe these are the things that you would like to manipulate. And you go, oh, you know, you, you did some good jobs there. Anything with an equal sign on it was probably a good guess. But for our intents and purposes, I'm going to clear that out. So I'm just going to hit clear. We go back. We realize all that stuff has now disappeared. What I want to do is I want to choose my own section. So I'm just going to highlight the area that I want to try and then hit add. So now that we have that added, we'll see that it's been highlighted. It's got the weird double S looking thing or whatever that is. Um, around it to let it know that's the position that I'm going to fuzz out. You have these att different attack types as well. Let me uh, zoom out a little bit here. And you've got sniper, battering ram, pitchfork, and cluster bomb. Very cryptically named as the good folks at <laughs> Port Swigger have done. <laughs> so understand that sniper is basically like I'm choosing a position, one position, and I'm going to run some fuzzing at that position. So I'm choosing one thing. If I do cluster bomb, I can choose multiple things. Also, Pitchfork does that as well, but it just does it in a different way. A different way. And Battering Ram is a weird thing where it, it takes in fuzz information, but does it to multiple different areas with the same information. I know, it sounds weird. You don't really have to worry about that at this point, I think, if you're new. Sniper is probably going to be your go-to de facto. So with that chosen, I've got Sniper. I've got the position set, which is the login area. Uh, and whatever I want to send. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to payloads. And once I'm here, I can actually tell it, what I want you to do is request that web page under login for the login name, try B, but also try Daniel, try David, try Billy, try SQL injection. I'm sorry, what was that last one? No big deal, just try it. You know, that's the, that's the <laughs> idea here. I'm going to be sending those things over to it and saying, try it and see what happens. And it's going to be up to me to be able to kind of discern what happens after that. But right now I just want to load a list or I can add items. I can say, Hey, you know, I'm going to do one, uh, or one equals one, one equals one. If I can do it right. Equals one. Um, like that. I could add it in singularly like that. I guess I'll zoom in for you one at a time, but that's not really what we're looking for here. So I'm going to remove that out. I'm going to clear. And I'm going to load from a file. Now, in my documents, I've created my own fuzzing file. It's just a flat file with information in it. I'll show you what that looks like. You can see if I uh, CD into my documents, this will not be in your computer because it's something I created myself. And if I do an LS for burp, because I named it burp something or other, I've got a few things here like uh, burp SQL I fuzz or burp SQL I auth dot text. So let's, let's take a look at that. If I cat burp SQL I underscore auth dot text, it's a bunch of different types of ways to try SQL injection against an authentication mechanism. I'm going to throw all this at our web app and see what happens. That's the idea so anyway. This is just your experience showing. I mean, you've you've put this list together, is that right? Based yeah. on experience. It, exactly. Every time I come up to a web application that has authentication and I try all my like go-to SQL injections to get past that and it doesn't work, I start trying this list and say, hey, see if that see if any of those will work. And if none of those work, and then I start doing some research and I find out some weird funky thing that allows me to get past it, like it did have a SQL injection, but you have to format it in just the right way. I'll take that and I'll add it to this list. So this list is like a living document. It continues to grow. Um, How much do we have to pay you to give it to give us the list? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're seeing it right now. So get buck wild, go, go crazy. The good news is, is that like search GitHub or just Google for SQL authentication fuzz lists, that kind of stuff. And you'll see stuff like this all day long and be able to download them. This one isn't even that big. There are, there are huge ones out there, so. Uh, just download so, them and put them in your machine. Daniel, just for new people, because there are going to be a lot of new people watching this, you keep using this term fuzz. Can you explain that? Oh, yeah, no problem. Fuzzing is the idea that I'm going to attempt to input data into a system, 
can be a web application, a standard desktop application, whatever, anything that takes input via digital methods and means, and I'm going to feed it anything and everything that I can make the computer do and see how it responds. So it's that idea of giving it inputs programmatically, like basically running through a list of inputs, trying it and seeing what happens. That is the basic idea behind fuzzing. So I'm looking for odd behavior or different behavior. That's great. Right. So that's, that's what you're looking at. All right. So now that you see kind of what's going on here, as I load this list up, it will make sense of what's going on. So I'm going to choose that. Where is it? Uh, SQL fuzz. And then just hit open. Once I do that, you'll see that list propagates and you can scroll through it and see there's that list. Great stuff. Now, now that we have this done, there are other options as well, but for right now, for most intents and purposes, you should be good to go. I would warn you, I think by default, yes. Oh my goodness, it's gonna drive me batty. So they've started doing this by default, payload encoding, URL encode these characters. That may be a good thing, that may be a bad thing. Sometimes web applications, once you send data to them, they will automatically URL encode those, which is basically saying, uh, I'm gonna give this in a safe URL format, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna manipulate the characters and, and URL encode them using URL structures, right? This is doing this by default. I'm gonna turn it off because I don't know that it wants URL encoded. I didn't see any URL encoding happening when we were sending data. So I'm assuming that that is not necessary. So you may need to toggle this off or on based off of the results that you get. If you try and it doesn't work, go back, turn it on or off or whatever you've done and try it again. So this can be a time consuming process. Just be forewarned on this. All right, let's see here. Whoopsie daisy, what am I doing here? Lowry, you're going crazy. I don't want the Windows machine. I'm in Kali, dang it. All right, so now that I have that going, Next thing I want to do is go to back to the positions tab and you have this start attack button right over here on the right hand side. Click that. And this is where we see the next kind of you're not as good as your pro version thing happening. <laughs> and this is probably my biggest complaints with the free community edition. And that is this warning right here that tells you that. Some functionality is disabled and attacks are time throttled. Please visit Port Swigger for more details about Burp Suite Professional, which doesn't do this in the professional version. So we're gonna see some intentional crippling of our capabilities as we deal with this, all right? So just be aware of that if you're using the free version. So I've hit okay, I'm going back and I'm seeing whether or not anything is happening. And you can see it's kind of rifling through all this data and you can see it's trying these different payloads as they were giving me the status that was returned by the application itself um, error and timeout the length of the data that was returned to us any comments that show up and then you can uh, kind of play around with this now what's interesting is where this is where it kind of lends to your understanding of how web applications work right so i'm going to zoom out here and one of the things I like to do is look at status and I like to look at length. If I start getting a bunch of, I don't know, 404, page not found, or 401, unauthorized, 403, unauthorized stuff, 500, there was an um, error on the back side, uh, on the server side, basically, was what's happening. Um, I know that that's not what I'm looking for. If I get a 200, that means it was successful. It actually sent a request and the web application said that was okay and returned something but I'm getting all 200s, no matter what. Now, either every one of these SQL injections are working, <laughs> highly unlikely, uh, or that's just how the page responds. I'm like, ah, darn, I wish that was not that way. So that can be one of the ways that you don't see what goes on. Maybe the length is gonna be a little more helpful. Okay, you returned a 200 status, but what else did you return? How big was that? And you'll notice that that information is varying. We've got some pages returned uh, 1,000, oh, I'm sorry, 13,575 bytes. And some of them return 2,523 bytes, 2,524 bytes, 21 bytes. What's the difference? Why the difference? So obviously I'm seeing some difference in what the application is doing. So maybe that will be a good indicator of whether or not 
I was successful in my attack. So let's, uh, what you can do is you can click the, the tab there and you can sort by those different lengths or sort by the statuses. So here I see I've got these different requests. And of course, if you click on them, they'll show you the actual request that was made. And of course, the most important thing, which was the response. And I wanna see whether or not it tells me, hello B, your secret is such and such. And uh, it says enter your credentials, the password, the login. Oh, it did, it, it actually gave me another user. It said, welcome AIM. I didn't even know that a user existed at this point, but the SQL injection said, this is the administrator for this system, just bypass all this stuff, and we fuzzed it out using the intruder to get past that. So now I can see uh, my secret aim or authorization is missing, whatever that means. So that's some, supposed to be some hint to what your password is. Great. Um, again, that's not normal. That's just specific to this application. But the fact that we got past that and it said, aim, how are you today? That lets me know that that SQL injection worked. And I should be able to use that uh, single quote or single quote, single, whatever this was. We have all sorts of other ones. Like this is a much more standard looking uh, response. Also gave me the same thing. So I can use that. So let me grab that request and just highlight it like so. I'm gonna right click, copy that. Let's get back out of here. Let's go over to the web app and see what happens if we put that, and I'm just gonna paste it in. Put anything I want in the password, because it doesn't matter, and then log in. Scroll down. So that gave us invalid credentials. So maybe that was the application itself coming back saying, hey, the administrator saying that didn't work, right? So actually, I think I know what the problem is. Let me paste that in. Let me, sometimes with these comments on the backside here, this can get a little janky. So let me take that out, try this. I don't know exactly what it's doing. We could get invalid credentials. Oh, I'm getting a SQL error. Oh, well that lets me know that maybe I can manipulate SQL at all, right? Because I didn't do something right. So maybe that was the correct thing and I need to just continue to look through the different SQL injections that I have available until I find the right one and looking to see. Now typically this is built to do SQL injection. So you're probably only gonna hit on a few, uh, a handful that would actually work. And this is a, a very weird, it's not an actual authentication me mechanism. It's kind of uh, simulating that experience. So we're, we're getting some odd output from that, but that's the basic idea is still there that I can fuzz things out. And that's what we're trying to look at, not necessarily to break the machine, but how does intruder work? And you can see it's still going, it's a little slow. And if I had more than, it looks like I have 119 different requests that I'm making, there's 96 and wait for it, 97. So it's, it's really slow. Uh, like I said, one of my pet peeves when it comes to using Burp Suite is specifically the intruder, but it does do this. And if you've got the time to set it and forget it and come back later and see, was I successful? Well, there you go. That's how you fuzz out whether or not an attack would work. I could also use a password list. I could say, oh, I know the user account is B, but I don't know what the password is. So I can grab something like RockU, throw it in there and let it fuzz out and see what kind of results I get with that. So it doesn't have to be SQL injection. It could be just about anything. Anything that you want to try to manipulate uh, that input and try multiple different things that could be possible, but would take you a hot minute to do manually, Intruder is going to be your best friend because it's going to do that programmatically and you just set it and forget it, walk away, come back when it's done and see if you got anywhere. So really like Intruder, especially on the pro version because it goes fast, but on the, on the <laughs> uh, community version, you can still do it. It's just gonna take you a bit of time. Anything else you can show us? Yeah, just a couple other things. We're not gonna get deep in the weeds on these. I'm just gonna kind of explain them because you need to be aware of them. One is the decoder. Love the decoder. I love and hate the decoder. Again, kind of some weird things here. If you see things that are coming back in any kind of, oh, let me see here. Let's say we wanted to, we'll just take this string and I'm going to right click on it and URL encode it as I type. So if I'm starting to type this, that, and you'll start to see that if I start using characters, um, like a, a space is showing up as a plus, you might not be able to see that. Let's see here. 
You see how the anytime I hit the space bar, yeah, there you go. It's showing up as a plus. That's a URL encoded thing, right? Or let me get back out of here. Let me do a, an easy way to kind of manipulate that. Actually, I can show you with decoder. It's funny. It decodes and encodes. It's called decoder, but it encodes and decodes. So let's say we popped in some. I needed to base sixty four encode a string of information. Let's say. Um, Get over here. This, this is a super secret thing, right? And I wanted to encode that using base64. Well, I'm in the decoder, which has encode, encode as base64. And then when I look down here at the lower half, I see that base64 encoded string of text. And of course, I can go the other way. If I have a base64 encoded string of text, like I do here, I can rock over here and decode it as base64, right? And as we rock over, we see it decodes that string for us. And as That's we right. saw, it's got a laundry list of stuff that you can decode or encode as. So HTML, base64, URL encoding, hex, octal, binary, gzip, all sorts of great stuff. So if you find yourself an encoded string that you want to look at or manipulate that data, you can decode it and encode it using the decoder option. The last thing we're gonna take a look at is the extender. And this is where you can take this free version and really ramp up its capabilities. Or, and if you've got the pro version, you can really, really ramp up its capabilities <laughs> because basically this is kind of the app store because it's called the <laughs> B app store right here. This is gonna be one of your favorite things. So if you go to the extender, and you hit the B App Store, you now have a list of extra functionality that you can add to your Burp Suite installation. Now, they will tell you whether or not you have to have the Pro version because some of them do require that. Let's take a look at that. And uh, let's see, over here in the, so if you select one, so if I, if I choose this Active Scan Plus Plus, it gives me the information over on this side of the screen, the right side of the screen. And you can see right there, this one requires Burp Suite Professional. So I won't be able to use that because I'm on Burp Suite Professional loaded here, but I can siphon through and even search through. It does have a search functionality. I can kind of look up in here and let's say I wanted to look for something related to JSON. Boom, I'll look for something to, with JSON. Go back over here and we should start to see it's filtering by applications that work with JSON or those different things. So I've got a JSON decoder. I've got a web token attacker. And again, like I go, like I said before, Burp Suite not really meant to be an attack mechanism per se, even though it has that intruder function, I guess you could call that an attack mechanism, but that says that's an attacker. And let's see, do I need anything? Nope. So I can just hit install. Once it's done, I should get another tab that's called it looks like it's gonna be called Joseph or maybe JSON. There you go, and it is called Joseph. You can see it showed up right there. Now I can click on that and start to work with the attack method against JSON web tokens. So going through that, that BWAP, the app store, the B app store, I guess it is, uh, and looking for good plugins or extensions, other capabilities in there can really increase the capabilities of your Burp Suite installation. So. Definitely check that out as well. That's great, Daniel. So, I mean, you mentioned um, on the, uh, where, where, where can we get some free training again? And do you have any kind of extra training that you'd recommend someone take at IT Pro TV? So I definitely work with Burp Suite in my IT Pro TV training. So you kind of pick that stuff up by proximity kind of thing. So if you're watching CEH or you're watching Pentest Plus or any of the other penetration testing uh, types of shows that I do or, or series courses that we have available in the IT Pro TV catalog, you're gonna see me use Burp Suite because a lot of these things are done through web applications. A lot of hacking techniques are done specifically towards web applications and Burp Suite is a great way to manipulate with that as you've seen. Uh, Port Swigger itself, the people that make Burp, Burp Suite, they have uh, their Burp Suite Academy or the Port Swigger Academy, I believe it's called, free to sign up walks you through all the different stuff, gives you a lot of great information, and it's all free. We'll show you a lot of the techniques with playing with SQL injections and 
different injection techniques, cross-site scripting, uh, all that good stuff. Completely free, so you can go check that out. And it's definitely a good supplement to what you're doing if you're going for something like certifications. So definitely um, sign up and, and play around with stuff and it'll give you all the information you need. They are the definitive source on what does what and how and why inside of Burp Suite because they make the thing. So if you want to know how this thing works and why it works, going to Port Swigger, looking at their documentation, it's gonna be a really good idea. Daniel, that's fantastic. I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time. I mean, you make this look so easy, but you know, I train and I do demos. I know demos can be really tough. So thanks so much for, you know, putting the effort in and, you know, doing these great demos. Hey man, I, I'm just happy to be able to help people that are trying to get started and get going with this stuff because I remember the first time somebody told me, oh, you just uh, do that in Burp Suite. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's easier said than done for you, but not for me. So I had that learning curve where I had nobody showing me. I just had to figure it out. So I, I always want to give kind of give back to the people that are just getting started that we can't assume that they know how to do stuff. We got to show them. That's brilliant. Daniel, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. No problem, man. Thanks for having me.